LRB FM in Carmel. It's 5.15 on a Monday afternoon, and that means it's time for Dialogue Conspiracy with Mae Brussel, probably the most famous or infamous, depending upon your perspective, public affairs program anywhere on radio, in which Mae Brussel of Carmel Valley relates her 10 years of research into political shenanigans, murders, and conspiracies to the events that shape the news week by week. Mae, take it away. This is Dialogue Conspiracy, a perspective of events which directly affect world affairs. Your host, research specialist May Brussel. Well, good afternoon and uh, hello from Dialogue Conspiracy. The news is coming in so quick that uh, relating the Watergate to the past political assassinations, conspiracies in the White House. For those of you who haven't heard the program before, the format has always been to take the news of the week and show how it pertained to the past political assassinations. But as the news of the Watergate unfolds, uh, the way conspiracies and assassinations are planned certainly becomes more visible to the viewer if he's watching the screen. He or she is watching that screen, watching the witnesses before the Senate committee, what we're getting is an exposure to the American public and education into espionage operations. I've maintained that the government was overthrown in 1963 when John Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas, and that the intelligence agencies took control of the government at that time. And those, the last election we had was in 1960. The, the actual choice of candidates has been selected for us. Since that time, through the ballot, through the bullet instead of the ballot, and that the conspirators are in the White House and they control the president, they control Lyndon Johnson, and they control Richard Nixon. If any of you didn't hear the Senate hearings this morning and hear Mr. Butterfield speak, uh, I suggest you turn on the cable television tonight and pick up the testimony of Mr. Butterfield. If you have any doubts about what it's like to be the President of the United States, I um, really felt sorry for Richard Nixon today. I know a lot of the things he's done. and In the course of my research, it's been some pretty uh, rough things that he's been associated with. And yet, when I heard the description of life in the Oval Office, there's something very tragic about it, very disgusting and very tragic. In this electronic age, Mr. Butterfield was the liaison of the Central Intelligence Agency to Richard Nixon. And to hear the description today, he obviously is Richard Nixon's babysitter. That's a term that is used to keep track of a person all the time, to count with who they talk to and what they do. A babysitter is assigned to a particular person uh, while they're on assignment, actually, to see that they get the job done. and. Um, follow them around. I know that the uh, Haldeman and Robert Haldeman and John Ehrlichman were always with Richard Nixon or outside the door and available to him. But it seems now that Mr. Butterfield is, is the babysitter for Richard Nixon or was. And his job was to have a two-way a communication system that picked up conversation in the Oval Office, in the cabinet room, in the halls, was a four-way speaker wherever he went, in the barber shop or wherever he went, and also out at the Western White House. He didn't have control of Camp David except the president's suite or down at Key Biscayne. And I always felt that the biggest decisions that Richard Nixon made on operations, he was briefed down in the, in the Bahamas and in Jamaica. Whenever there's a problem, he runs down there to get briefings, and he's told what to do. So it would be very reasonable that they wouldn't have a two-way conversation recorded there. But in the White House, and at the Western White House at San Clemente, and in his room at Camp David, he has a um, two-way speaker system. When he walks through the doors, it automatically turns on the conversation. And every telephone conversation he's ever made, and every visit he's ever had, anybody who's ever visited him in any of these areas, that conversation has been recorded. The cover story was that was to keep him uh, for historic purposes. Someday they would publish these conversations, but it came as quite a shocker to the committee investigating the election practices of 1972 that all of the conversations of the President of the United States have been recorded. And um, I felt 
sick for the man because I know the kinds of conversations that could be picked up now, and Mr. Butterfield is sure that this would prove the president's innocence with regard to certain conversations. But just a few weeks ago, uh, Howard Hunt testified before the grand jury about the George Wallace shooting, and he told how Charles Colson was at the president's uh, office for four hours the night that George Wallace was shot. And I, I said on other programs, I've expressed my opinion, that was part of the Southern strategy, that Wallace had to be shot before the election so he wouldn't swing so many votes against Richard Nixon. And the conversation that um, Charles Colson had that evening for four hours would be recorded, too, what he said about Wallace. The instructions right after that meeting that Colson had with the president, he went some other phone and called Howard Hunt and told him to get out to Arthur Bramer's apartment and see if there's any literature there assigned to the leftists, which is like an order to plant literature. Go see if it's there, because you know he's going to find it if he goes out. I didn't go out, but somebody else was in the apartment and messed it around. But uh, the conversations of every single person, members on the committee, every congressman, senator, everyone who's visited with the president, it's all down there. And it must be setting Washington into some it was, it was, there was this nervous feeling that went over the television, people rustling around. You know, you could tell the energy in the room when this testimony was coming over and the announcers afterwards, how sick so many people must feel and the control, the blackmail you have over other people. And uh, also you realize the lack of privacy that the president himself has with any single person. He doesn't turn the speaker on or off when he goes in the room. The speaker's triggered, and he is recorded. And I can't imagine anything worse than spending a couple of years of having every single thing you say recorded and people keeping track of what you're doing. Mr. Butterfield, incidentally, left in a hurry, he left the White House in a hurry. He was the most important uh, person in charge of Richard, Richard Nixon, and he went to the uh, aviation board right after this was in March because the question of the sabotage of the airplane that Mrs. Howard Hunt was on was coming up and there was a, a investigator in Chicago, Sherman Skullnick, going into this airplane crash and saying it was a conspiracy. So that Mr. Butterfield left the White House in a hurry and went to the Department of Transportation. Dwight Chapin, the appointment secretary for the president, went out to Chicago for the United Airlines hearings. And Butterfield went to the Department of Transportation where he has been working while this investigation of the plane has been going on. I had a long radio telephone conversation with Alex Bottos, the investigator with Sherman Skolnick of the Watergate and Midway Air Crash. They call it the Watergate and Midway Air Crash. And Alex Bottos has a hearing coming up in Chicago, and they're trying to put him in prison. He was put in Springfield Penitentiary in Missouri on a charge um, a trumped-up charge that he didn't commit, and he felt it was to silence him because he knew too much about the case he was at the airport when Mrs. Hunt's plane came down. And he was put in prison, and he was let out. He was in from March until about June. And he's coming before a Judge Beamer, and he asked me to announce to my radio audience to write a letter to Judge N. Beamer, B-E-A-M-E-R, the U.S. District Court in South Bend, Indiana, that's where this hearing is coming up, and ask him, please, to not send Alex Bottas to jail. This is Judge Beamer, U.S. District Court, South Bend, Indiana. Now, Alex Bottas and Skolnick had an investigator who was going to testify for the government side. His name is Mr. Simonini. And 30 years he worked with the U.S. military as a radar specialist, and he was an eyewitness to this crash. 553, and he was going to be a witness before the National Safety Transportation Board. But when he met Chairman Skolnick and heard the other side of the crash and all the evidence, he changed his story and decided that he would go with the investigators and that something was very wrong with this plane he felt was sabotaged. Well, Mr. C Simonini's home was broken down last week and the door was broken down on one of these forced drug raids and a gun was held to his daughter's head and Two sons were taken away from his home. He lives in Texas, but he was at the airport when this plane went down. They took him, his sons from Texas and put them in a Tucson jail in Tucson, Arizona, two of his teenage sons. And one of the roommate of, jailmate of one of the sons hung himself this week and uh, 
was dead and he's terrified that his son won't live the other son won't live his family has been threatened as i say the daughter had the pistol to her head and mr simonetti is testifying for alex bottos and testifying to the fact that there was sabotage on this plane but in the meantime he's having a hard time and his family is uh, harassed and the two sons are in jail so uh if you would be so inclined write to judge beamer and tell him that you want Alex Bottas out of prison, that he feels that he has these charges are trumped up against him, and he's innocent of these charges. They're trying to get him out of the way because he was right there at the airport that the airplane crashed. Now, one of the reasons Alex Bottas revealed that he wanted uh, to be out of prison, out of Springfield, he felt the federal government was getting him, and he gave a reason. He said because his code name, used to be Bates, B-A-T-E-S, and that he worked with Howard Hunt at the time of the Bay of Pigs. He was a senior recruiter for the Bay of Pigs. This is the first time I've heard this information about Bottas, but he's desperate now because he they're going to take him off to prison. And he said that, that uh, he worked with Howard Hunt, and he knew the way this operation worked, and he knew about Hunt, and he knew about Hunt's wife, um, the husband and wife team of being agents, Sherman Skolnick had said that they weren't married. They were both husband and wife agents, and I didn't know where he got that information, but obviously he got it from Bottoms, who worked with uh, Hunt at the time of the Bay of Pigs, and I guess in other operations. Uh, there's three articles in the San Francisco Examiner this last week on that airplane crash uh, that got a lot of coverage. Uh, it talked about the tape's last messages on the airplane and gaps in the information coming in. And the lead article asked, uh, was this plane sabotaged because they were going to blackmail Richard Nixon with information that Mrs. Hunt was on the plane? One of the articles in the San Francisco Examiner said, had to die to save Nixon. And it goes about the theory that Mrs. Hunt had to die because she was going to blackmail Richard Nixon. But there's two interesting points about that plane crash. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure most of you know who Mrs. Hunt is. Her husband is a defendant in the Watergate case, and uh, he's already in prison for charges of conspiracy and entering the Democratic headquarters. And Mrs. Hunt was a conduit of money for these men to, to buy clemency, for them to keep quiet and plead guilty, the other men that are in jail. And they'd be out in a year. And she was carrying money around. Uh, and... Sherman Skolnick claims that she was taking a lot of money, over $2 million, to Costa Rica. And from there, she would blackmail Richard Nixon and get money for her husband. One of the men on the airplane was a Mr. Metcalf. And he was a cutout, which is an espionage agent who later is eliminated himself, who's killed. And he was called the hitman. He got on the airplane, and he was a top narcotics official with the Dale program, the Drug Abuse Law Enforcement Program who used the name Harold Metcalf, Metcalf. And he worked directly for Richard Nixon. He took a gun on this plane. He was given seat B-17, right near the stewardess, and the jump seat. And he was an overseas CIA parachute spy who had a jumpsuit at the time the plane crashed. He was sitting at the back and got out. He didn't realize that parts of the plane uh, were broken. And that this plane, he did get out, but he didn't realize how what bad shape the plane was with the altimeter and the data computer broken and, and circuit breakers broken but he was prepared to jump but the there was an interesting thing in the information i had from sherman skulnick and in the uh, article in the examiner because it claimed that he sat near the front of the plane where the food was served and that these passengers had arsenic in their stomach several including the pilot and um he mentions the position of this particular Metcalf to where the food was served. And the very last tape, the la one of the articles examined says the tape's last message when the, in the last seconds before the jet went down was that the pilot was speaking. And the very last word he's, that they could hear, the last intelligible words spoken in the cockpit of the doomed jet were, I'm sorry. Now, the voice print hasn't been recognized. Who said, I'm sorry? But it's the hitman from the, the crime force, from Dale, the narcotics program, and from the CIA, is sitting in the front serving the food. And if the pilot got arsenic, and he's going out for the feck of it, no matter whether it takes five seconds or a minute or whatever it is, 
if he in fact did have something to drink or eat on the plane, uh, was it Metcalf or another passenger who was saying, I'm sorry to the pilot? Because the flight recorder, the tape message shows no conversation before the plane crashed. The pilot was not alive. So I wonder who's saying, I'm sorry, I haven't seen any of the articles, and I'll write to Sherman Scully, but considering the cast of characters and where they came from and what they were doing, it sounds like somebody knew that the pilot was going to have to be killed, and those were his last words. Uh, in Dialogue Conspiracy, we talk about a lot of planned operations against the people in this country to take control, and there's one thing which has nothing to do with political assassinations, but is part of a larger conspiracy towards fascism, and that was the article this week on the electric wall between the United States and Mexico, because I know a lot of our agent provocateurs from the Special Forces have jumped out of airplanes on these so-called hijacking cases where nobody's killed and uh, nothing really is taken, the money's given back, but a law comes in, the airports are covered, guards are at the airport, and everything is covered uh, in terms of... Uh, egress and ingress, leaving this nation, uh, going over the borders, getting on an airplane. In case we had a police state or an emergency status, we have the laws now. The provocateurs and the hijackers created the excuse for the laws and the marshals in every airport. Well, now we have the uh, announcement this week that the McNamara line in Vietnam was being implanted, implanted in 2,000 miles between the United States and Mexico. It's going to be an electronic fence with sensitive sensors. Now, it's supposed to tell whether laborers are coming in or drug problems, but Air America and the CIA have been bringing drugs in and airplanes and helicopters. It's not going to stop the heavy drug traffic by any stretch of the imagination, but it will stop people from escaping. And we're supposed to have a six-mile-wide clearance between here and Canada of bush cut down a place where you could see people fleeing or moving, and now between here and Mexico, there's a 2,000 mile border that's going to have an electric fence. I think it's very bad. Um, I don't know what people can do about the congressmen who are taken by surprise or say they would. They, they allow the money for these things. And there's usually a warning. These things aren't just built. They said it'll be up by mid-1974, and a million, 1.5 million has been earmarked for this year for the fence. Uh, seems interesting at a time when there's so little money for legal aid for the poor that we could spend a million dollars for this particular electric fence. But I'm sure the assembly line was built up and we had one in Vietnam, so we have to keep that factory going, whether we need it or not. You know, it, it'll be made. The president is sick this week. A lot of people have called in the different radio shows called The House and want to know about the nature of his illness. Is he really sick? Is he against the wall? Will he come out alive? And uh, it's a hard question to answer. He's under tremendous pressure. Uh, knowing what I know about him, I don't see how I can take any of the pressure. I don't see why they'd want him to live. He, he can't tell that he knew about the bug. He can't say he, he knew about the cover-up or he'd be out. And it's hard to believe he didn't because all the evidence is pointing that way. If he didn't know about it, then he isn't competent to be president. So. Either way, he's trapped. He, he went in the hospital immediately after being forced with a constitutional crisis of producing logs and interviews in the White House. He went immediately to the hospital, and then he, he told Senator Sam Irvin that he would meet him and discuss the logs, and uh, he will not testify before the committee, but then he went right to the hospital. And he meets with Henry Kissinger or General Alexander Haig and has 40-minute conferences on what he calls his uh, world affairs and security briefings on national security, and certainly the domestic problem is on national security. I don't know why national security is separated into what happens as soon as you leave the country, and they get the considerations and the budgets and the briefings, but at home he doesn't know anything that's going on, according to him. So the, uh, our own domestic crisis or... The, he, says he wasn't aware of the Watergate for a long, long time. I can't, it's hard to believe that, but he meets with Alexander Haig or Henry Kissinger, but not Sam Irvin, and how long he can put that off, you know, it's hard to tell. Uh, there was information this week about the White House plumbers. For those of you who don't know who the White House plumbers were, they were 
two men who were brought into the White House at uh, Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy, who were given the job of, um, they were supposed to find leaks for the National Security Council, and that was their cover. They're actually an attack group to create a lot of chaos during the period just before Richard Nixon became president, and they were involved in the Chappaquiddick scene and with the ITT with Dita Beard and with demonstrations for the Miami Convention and the demonstrations when J. Edgar Hoover was um, passed away outside his resting place and, and they were in on the robbery of Ellsberg's doctor and forging documents of John Kennedy. The name Plumbers suggests that they were stopping some leaks. Actually, the man who gave out the leaks was promoted in the Defense Department. But the information about these two men has been withheld, and I'm interested in uh, that information, which is just pouring out this week about the violence and the provocateurs planned for the conventions and the plumber unit, because the um, article I did last year on the Democratic Party claimed that there would be a martial law and that this team was in on creating enough disturbance to uh, provide the excuse for a takeover in the United States identical to the one we had helped out in the Philippines or in Greece or many other countries. So the, the work that Hunt and Liddy did in the White House <clears throat> is very important to see whether they were sincerely trying to do anything to help this country while on a, an expensive salary from the taxpayers or whether they were really just consistently a tax group. So information came out this week that L. Patrick Gray, who was acting head of the FBI, received information from the CIA along with Henry Peterson. He was the acting uh, attorney, assistant attorney general helping prosecute the Watergate case. But immediately after the break-in on June the 17th, the CIA turned over to these plumbers, Hunt and Liddy and Peterson, uh, information data on the CIA's involvement in domestic affairs, namely the Ellsberg affair and a few of the other operations they had done. And Patrick Gray and Peterson kept that in their office and safe and didn't tell any single person. I mean, now, the prosecutors in the Ellsberg uh, case um, acted. The government prosecutors knew that there were these tape recordings, and the case was going on in session at the time that Watergate was being investigated. And L. Badriger was the acting head of the FBI, and he kept in his safe the CIA documents on the Ellsberg case photographs of the men at the Ellsberg's office, the aliases that the CIA provided. When Howard Hunt returned from Los Angeles, he called up the CIA and asked them to develop certain pictures that he had taken out of the Ellsberg case, and he had used the aliases that the CIA always provided him of Edward Joseph Warren and Edward V. Hamilton when he went out west. So that when the government was investigating the Ellsberg Case, prosecuting the Ellsberg case, investigating the Watergate. Patrick Gray was sitting on all this information and nobody knew he had it. He destroyed a lot of it. Later, he destroyed things from the White House that were forged documents and um, that he got from the State Department that Dean was working on and Howard Hunt was working on. But here was a man who uh, I described a year ago, Patrick Gray, as a man who puts down investigations, who doesn't help the information to flow out, but does everything to put it down. So the document, uh, the article I got this week on how he put down the investigation, he wouldn't let the federal government know what aliases that uh, Hunt had used or Barker had used or Sturgis. He didn't let them know the information he had in his safe. And worst of all, uh, Mr. Kleinitz, who was the attorney general, also realized that the CIA information had been turned over it had been turned to him. When the Watergate men were arrested, the CIA turned to, to Mr. Richard Klein, the Attorney General, and gave them all the information on the Ellsberg case, on the Watergate case, on Dita Beer, the ITT, and the work of the Watergate men. And Mr. Klein delivered it to Mr. didn't deliver it to Mr. Peterson, the Assistant Attorney General, who was investigating and needing this information. His argument was that he didn't know what was in the envelope. The Attorney General received information from the CIA as early as June and July, and Mr. Peterson and Mr. Um, uh, Gray kept it locked up. The prosecutor for the Watergate case and the acting head of the FBI locked up until June of this year, until April 27th of this year, information that would have helped the prosecution of the case. They, they obstructed 
justice right down the line, and one of the men who helped with the obstruction of justice was the Attorney General again. Well, last week we heard the uh, story of John Mitchell saying that he hid the conspiracies of the White House plumbers, all their illegal acts or wiretapping, bugging, foraging, because considering the alternatives of who would be president, he didn't have any other choice. This is something else I, I've said on Dialogue Conspiracy. For those of you who have listened many times, that, that the selection of presidents is done by a handful of people. And if anything came out that was damaging to Richard Nixon or Spiro Agnew, it was the job of the Attorney General, the Assistant Attorney General, the FBI, to hide that because they want Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew elected. So the laws of the land are secondary. They have selected this man as a candidate. And nothing stands in the way, even if these men lose their law degrees and go to prison. They decided that Richard Nixon should be the president. Now, Richard Klein has resigned from the Justice Department because he said that he couldn't be there and prosecute his friends like John Mitchell. But he resigned after he held vital evidence of a conspiracy from the CIA in his files and would refuse to prosecute or examine those agents that were involved. The 1947 Charter of the Central Intelligence Agency says that they cannot work inside the United States. I've made the allegation for a long time that they've been working inside the United States for many, many years, ever since they were formed. There was an interesting article in Washington Post this week because Tom Charles Houston is the young man who ordered this inter, uh, intelligence agency in the United States that would open, surreptitiously enter a home burglarize, wiretap, open mail, things that J. Edgar Hoover objected to because he said you'd lose your uh, civil rights. Well, Tom Charles Houston was behind one of the congressional committees giving testimony this week, and um, he made memos on his interagency department. And at the time that Richard Helms was asked about domestic affairs in the United States, this was in February of 73, he said to the Congress under oath, we were not involved because it seemed to me it was a clear violation of what our charter was. And then there's a memo of Tom Houston in July 1970 where he said Dick Helms was most cooperative and helpful and went along with the bugging plan. The CIA is exposed every day on the television. If you hear the hearings of Herbert Kalmbach today, he tells about money dropped off at certain places, put in envelopes that he didn't open. He didn't know who it was for. He could raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. He said he had safes in New York, but he didn't know where they were. <laughs> he had 1.2 million cash in California, 350,000 with uh, Mr. Haldeman. But he spoke about meeting with John Dean or Mr. Lasswitz in a car by the airport. They would meet at, on the street by a hotel. They'd meet in a parkway. They would make telephone calls to each other. One would call from a phone and say, you go to another phone, and then the other one would call from there. They used code names on each other. They used safe houses. Uh, they had a basement in Washington where they did a lot of their work. Uh, it was a special safe house where they were working uh, in secret, dishing out the money, I guess, or deciding where it goes. I have an article there about this basement shop that they ran, you know, for their secret money in Washington, D.C., they were at the hotels and in the basements, and those are called safe houses. But the whole operation that Kalmbach gave today, the, the president's attorney, is that they needed money because uh, the families were going to have high expenses with lawyers, and uh, now that they were arrested at the Watergate Hotel, but they couldn't send the check like any other person would like. Here, Howard, you've been my friend a long time. Here's 25000 Everything was in $100 bills. They were all cash. They were all set from what they said was 1968 money, which is a tall story, I imagine, and then set to separate bank accounts and pulled out to serve certain needs. And they used code names. He went over the code names again of all the different people. And the safe houses, the parkways, the sterile phone numbers and their cameras. And uh, they had cameras in, in tobacco pouches and chapstick for their lips, wherever they were, they could take pictures of people and around the corners. and. Uh, so now Richard Helms is being called back because uh, four or five times now the CIA has been caught working inside the United States, which they're not supposed to do. And they hope that this thing will die down and that people won't toughen up again, that they'll just forget about it. But they're into every single one of these Watergate operations. And 
at the time when I did the article on the real estate a year ago, I said that the CIA funded the operation was behind the whole affair. Um, they keep denying it. I don't know what, I think that if the interagency group that was formed uh, is still in existence, which it seems to be, they could prosecute Richard Helms. They're talking about prosecuting Richard Helms for perjury and lying about the use of the UCLA in domestic affairs. Uh, there was another interesting article in the New York Times this week on the ITT. Because when we talk about broad conspiracies, how you pay people to shoot Robert Kennedy, a guard from Lockheed who comes on, how does he get paid? What's the chain of the command? Who gives the orders? Uh, in my research, I feel that the National Security Council has a body of 40 men who sit and decide who lives and who dies and what countries will be overthrown, including the United States. And this National Security Council gets uh, orders from large corporations or conglomerates, such as Howard Hughes and the ITT. And there was a very interesting article this week. There's a new book out and book reviews on ITT being a Nazi corporation that was formed during World War II, making planes for Hitler and bombing Americans and then being paid by the Americans when they lost their airplane factory and settling down in Jamaica in the West Indies. But the ITT now was exposed as having uh, revealed the way they give campaign money to uh, for certain purpose, persons in her office. And they are going back between the 1972 political campaign and the 1960 campaign. And one of the corporation heads has explained that they give through people on salary at ITT, making 20000 30000 a year. Each one of those people can individually give to a campaign a certain amount. Then that corporation pays those people back so that it looks like private gifts and the sum total of a million dollars or more is never recorded. Mr. Clement Stone, the financier who was behind Richard Nixon, has announced that he gave six to eight million dollars since 1968 to this campaign. Now there's a limit on what the amount that he's supposed to give, but the way he gets away with it is that all the different employees where he is at his insurance firm, can all cough up a certain amount of money for the Republican campaign. And then he pays them back out of the profits. They get a raise or something, and he pays them back. So ITT has revealed their secret funding. But the interesting thing about the article this week was that they, it goes into the money they gave Bobby Baker and Lyndon Johnson. Well, the ITT offices are in to the Watergate affair. Uh, Mullen Associates represents their interest. Mullen is the office across the street from the White House that Howard Hunt came from. Douglas Caddy is a lawyer who works at ITT. Uh, he was mentioned by Herbert Kalmbach in terms of funding or, or being asked to fund for these men that were arrested. Caddy uh, also was at the jail when the men were arrested to help them with the original charges. Douglas Caddy works at Mullen's that represents ITT. Um, G. Gordon Liddy was flying out to Las Vegas to rob Hank Greenspan's file for ITT. They were supposed to be going to the Democratic headquarters to get papers about the ITT. But the interesting thing uh, about this huge conglomerate is that in 1960, Mr. Naylor, who worked for them, told Hal Janine, one of the heads, that the board had a program that is very important to political protection and business development. And therefore, they funded Lyndon Johnson, and through Bobby Baker, Bobby Baker was up for indictment and federal prosecution, but they had secret ways of funding him and giving $1 million to the Nixon administration and the same amount to the Johnson administration earlier to make sure that their interests are known in the White House. Uh, Mr. Um, Naylor, the man who received the money from ITT and then took it out of other people's salaries, was feeling that, that his his way of operating was being exposed. He said at the age of 47, his principles and are being questioned and he would go up for perjury and he got caught on the Bobby Baker funding and was feeling badly about the exposure, not doing it, you know. But the influence of this one corporation into the chain of command of Dallas when, when Kennedy was killed, the 1960 funding of Lyndon Johnson, Bobby Baker, because Baker's been named heavily into the part, the assassination conspiracy. So this huge conglomerate has been behind our presidents and 
interested when Kennedy was killed in seeing that Baker and, and Lyndon Johnson were heavily financed by them. And they're staunch Republicans now as ITD that sent a million dollars to the Nixon administration to sabotage the elections in Greece. They do the same thing at home. This is the group that sabotages, that pays our agents to do the things that they're doing. There is an interesting uh, uh, court case uh, off the Watergate for one minute that took place in Washington, D.C. because two men were arrested on a murder charge. Clinton Phillips was one of them, and uh, another. Th there were two men involved, a conviction of carrying a dangerous weapon, and another friend with them, Henry Jones. Th these men were defendants in a criminal case. And the, the prosecution kept comparing them to Jack Ruby and Sir Han and the other alleged assassins, James Ray and Richard Speck. And his argument was that this man isn't crazy. Uh, they wanted to use an insanity plea, these two men, on a murder charge. And uh, no fewer than three occasions, he drew an analogy, the prosecution between these two men as not being crazy, that they were like Sir Han and James Ray and Jack Ruby. And the judge threw the case out of court. And the case was thrown out. He said, you can't affect a jury by comparing them to any other case. He said, you can read about big cases about Sirian, Sirian, and Ruby and these big cases, but you can't plead to a jury that your client, or that man, not your client, the man you're prosecuting, is not, that, that he's not crazy, just like they're not crazy. You can't compare him to them as being a shrewd operator. So this prosecutor realized that the convictions of Sirian, Sirian, and James Ray, and um, Speck and some of these things are stretched, Ruby, that they're not really insane, that they're trumped up charges, and that when the people commit these crimes, they're perfectly sane. So this is the point he was trying to make, that, that the person who was hiding behind mental illness, the two men at the time of this murder, couldn't use that defense anymore. And the judge threw out the whole case for the two murder convictions, because he said you can't compare anybody who's up for murder to these other cases. And I thought that was an interesting thing that, that the judges threw the whole case out. Whether or not they did the murder wasn't important, but if the prosecution was going to say they were shrewd and playing dumb and really smart like Sir Hant and James Ray and uh, the other men, the judge threw the case out and the men were free, and I don't even think they're going to have a retrial. Uh, there was an article about a lot of conversation about American Airlines funding money to pay off the Watergate uh, people that, that Herbert Kalmbach had uh, contacted. And the important thing was that, that in the course of revealing these contributions, it opened up the list of 2,000 more names of people that have contributed to Richard Nixon that was allegedly found in his secretary's office. Because the um, American Airlines is, is not supposed to give money 55000 or 100000 as a corporation. And all of this given in cash, $100 bills. But when they're apprehended for doing something illegally, what they said was, we want the return of the money. And this is the fourth group that has asked for money back from Richard Nixon. They don't want to be investigated for their crimes. They, they want their money back. And just transpose that to some robber or Black Panther or any poor person who's caught in a robbery and takes a television set or takes somebody's purse. And the police catch up with them, the law enforcement say, oh, you've got this television, you stole it from your neighbor down the street or the money. So he says, well, I'll give the thing back. I didn't mean to keep it, I'll just give it back and uh, I won't be arrested. These huge corporations have every loophole to keep from going to jail. All they have to say is, I gave it back. If, if it was tainted, you know, the money was tainted, I don't want to keep it. So they're giving money back that went to the committee to reelect the president and hoping that they'll get off. I think there's an injustice in um, getting away with this kind of thing. Down in Houston, Texas, where they're investigating at $700,000, all in cash, that was mixed in with the Mexican money. Uh, they, it's tied in with a billion dollar contract for natural gas in the Soviet Union. But when they were found with 114000 that was in Bernard Barker's bank, they said, oh, get, we'll get our money back. Give me, Mr. Allen says, give us our money back. And that's not the point. The point is that, that they they should be reimbursed. Maybe they should. Maybe they're innocent of some charges. I don't know. But the American Airlines and these other companies that are caught and on the list that want their money back, I don't know why they get off so easy. 
by just saying they made an error. You find this in a lot of these cases, is it's been a year, and so far only seven people have been indicted in the Watergate case. They've had a year to prosecute. Herbert Kalmbach was on the stand today. He'll be back on tomorrow morning. That's Richard Nixon's personal attorney that has a foundation for the Nixon Library with millions of dollars in it who handled the business transaction of Richard Nixon when he bought his home down at down San Clemente. And he gets on the stand and testified he's only seen Richard Nixon three times in the last three or four years. That must be, really be a weird lawyer-client relationship. You see, this is the way the espionage agencies work. Uh, they only are on a need to know. They see each other for only the most important kind of business, but they're always there in the sidelines to fill in for what Nixon needs to pay people off and uh, like in the Watergate case, he's his own personal lawyer, building a foundation, a library for him, purchases his home for him, and they've only met three or four times. That's what Kalmbach said under oath. Kalmbach sent $400,000 to Alabama to defeat Alabama State, to defeat George Wallace down there in the primaries. He kept $1.1 million in cash in 1968, and he sent it to boxes in New York and Washington and Los Angeles in Newport Beach, but he's testified under oath he didn't know where the banks were. He has these bank accounts, and he doesn't know whose name there is. He doesn't know where they are. He had $600,000 in a secret bank, and he had $1.1 million cash that Mr. Higby, who worked for Haldeman, had. Um, he spent, he had some more money, about $100,000 he used for polling costs, and oh, another 100000 he gave to Anthony Lasowitz. I was waiting for the committee to ask what Laswitz did. He was involved up at Chappaquiddick. As soon as um, Mary Capeshny was dead, he was up there giving interviews over the uh, radio and for the news media. Uh, the White House hasn't said what he was doing at Chappaquiddick or when he got on the island or checked his, his transportation or his aliases. But it's interesting that he was right up there the minute the callback was arrested and he... Uh, the, uh, he was up there, not, he, but Callback had funded $100,000 to Lasowitz, who was up at Chappaquiddick the minute the accident had taken place. And he was, Lasowitz was giving the interviews to the news media, slanting the question of Ted Kennedy's accident, giving out interviews. $100,000 was given by this attorney to Anthony Lasowitz for this assignment. Uh, Haldeman that came out. Uh, in the paper this week had a 1.5 million cashier's check from the Security Pacific National Bank in 1970, and he's the cash. The source of this cash is still unexplained. He, Mr. Kalmbach, drew from this fund. They don't know where this came from. Uh, all of these things are going on, and people are saying, is Richard Nixon involved in the Watergate? It's hard to believe how much of this he knew or he didn't know. No, Herbert Callback, his attorney, had a dummy front called the Public Institute. I wrote about dummy fronts in the article I did on the Watergate, and I'll be doing more on dummy fronts. And he had a political aide, Jack Gleason, who helped him and split up the money and forwarded it wherever it had to go. And the operation was run in a basement in a back room downtown Washington in a townhouse. And that's where they put $3 million dollars into the 1970 elections in the Senate and the State House races had $3 million in cash in his basement and the front of it, it, it had a dummy friend called the Public Institute. Some of that money went to Senator Weicker and he said he didn't know where it came from. He's on the committee investigating the Watergate. He took 35000 from what was called the Washington, D.C. Committee for Weicker and some of it came out of this $3 million cash fund in the basement under a dummy front. The townhouse operation uh, was for Senate campaigns, supposedly, but it involved a lot of money, and none of it is accounted for who got it or where it went. When Mr. Weiger was on this uh, Senate committee, just last week, Charles Colson, who always gives the leaks and tries to damage people's smear campaigns, tried to smear Senator Weiger as being paid off by this secret funding, too, and Weiger got furious. He did accept the 35000 and he said he didn't know where it came from. So it seems to have come from the callback fund that goes around and around in circles. Well, next week, I think we'll talk, we'll go into the 
convention and the provocateurs, the Democrats were spied upon by one to 200 agents at a hotel right outside the Miami headquarters. The rooms were paid for through the First National Bank at Miami. The White House made the reservations and 200 uh, agents with rental cops had electronic surveillance to take down the entire Democratic uh, uh, convention in Miami. That is a lot of agents. That's a big budget. Uh, we're going to see that they spent 10 to $20 million in secret money sabotaging the elections as time goes on. The news is coming in really fast, and our time is up. I'll see you next week, and listen to the hearings. If you're not listening to them, you really should, and I'll see you next week. You've been listening to Dialogue Conspiracy, featuring research specialist May Brussels.